Hello, and welcome to Conversations from the World of Allergy, a podcast produced by the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. I'm your host, Dave Stukas. I'm a board-certified allergist and immunologist and serve as a social media medical editor for the Academy. Our podcast series will use different formats to interview thought leaders from the world of allergy and immunology. This podcast is not intended to provide any individual medical advice to our listeners. We do hope that our conversations provide evidence-based information. Any questions pertaining to one's own health should always be discussed with their personal physician. The Find an Allergist search engine on the Academy website is a useful tool to locate a listing of board-certified allergists in your area. Finally, use of this audio program is subject to the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology Terms of Use Agreement, which you can find at www.aaai.org. Today's edition of our Conversations from the World of Allergy podcast series is from our Hot Topic series, and will focus on a very timely subject of COVID-19 vaccines. And we are extremely pleased to welcome Dr. John Kelso as our guest for today's episode. Dr. Kelso is a practicing allergist within the Division of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology at Scripps Clinic in San Diego, and a clinical professor of pediatrics and internal medicine at the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine. Dr. Kelso has held many significant appointments during his distinguished career, including as a member of the Board of Directors for the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, and a member of the Board of Directors for the American Board of Allergy and Immunology, as well as on the Pulmonary Allergy Drugs Advisory Committee for the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. He has a special interest in adverse reactions to vaccines and served as, as a chief editor for the 2012 Adverse Reactions to Vaccines Practice Parameter Update. I could go on and on discussing Dr. Kelso's many contributions, but suffice to say, I can't imagine a better guest to discuss anything and everything about the new COVID-19 vaccines. However, before we begin, I'd like to emphasize to all of our listeners that the information we discuss today is current as of today's date in recording, December 21st, 2020. If we've learned nothing else during the COVID-19 pandemic, it's that evidence and recommendations can change rapidly. As such, the information we discuss during today's episode may be subject to change, and I encourage everyone to stay up to date through vetted resources, such as the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology COVID-19 Task Force updates, or the Centers for Disease Control. And with that, Dr. Kelso, thank you for your patience during the intro, and thank you so much for taking the time to join us today, and welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much for having me. Oh, this is going to be great. Um, and I know a lot of our listeners have many questions and hopefully we'll address uh, most of them uh, today. But before we get into the topic, I'd really like to start with a question that I've asked a lot of our guests lately. How are you doing right now? And what are things like in Southern California where you live at the moment? Well, I guess I'd say I'm uh, hanging in there like, like the rest of us. Um, Southern California, as you've probably heard, is kind of a recent hotspot for uh, COVID hospitalizations and uh, like other parts of the country, our intensive care units are in fact filling up. Uh, so it's uh, a certainly a, a concerning time, but we're hoping that with the uh, vaccines that that'll be our chance to get on the other side of the pandemic. Mm, absolutely. Well, I hope that you and all of your loved ones and everybody that you know and work with stays as safe as possible, uh, especially over the winter months. And you know, as you mentioned, you know, as of today's recording, the US FDA has approved now two vaccines for COVID-19. And I'm sure that you've had a lot of thoughts and emotions surrounding this as we all have. But overall, how does this news make you feel? Well, uh, I really do feel like it, it allows us to have some, some hope. And as people have said, see the light at the end of the tunnel. It, it, it's interesting that they, they've really come absolutely not a moment too soon, uh, where we're just seeing these uh, record, really horrifying uh, numbers of deaths every day. And to have these vaccines uh, starting to roll out um, really has provided uh, a sense of hope and, and absolutely is what we need and really the only way that we're going to uh, control the, the pandemic. So I'm, I'm very hopeful. Yeah, I, I love that word. I agree. Um, hope. I, I, I think that's what we all should have right now. And that's great. It, you know, throughout this pandemic, it, it's as allergists and immunologists, you know, um, we've had a wonderful role of explaining some basic aspects of the immune system to a lot of our patients and friends and family members and neighbors. Uh, and so I'd like to start with some basics with you. And can you just give us a brief overview of you know, why we use vaccines in general and, and how do these vaccines protect us against infectious diseases? Sure. So for um, decades now and even longer, we've had uh, the availability of vaccines to 
uh, prevent against infectious diseases with the idea that um, rather than waiting to get infected and suffering the consequences of various uh, infectious diseases, many of which can have serious long lasting consequences and, and have a, a uh, rate of fatality or mortality, that if you're exposed to the infectious agent in a way prior to your exposure um, uh, with a vaccine, uh, that you, you have the chance to build up an immunity. So uh, most vaccines consist of injecting patients with some modified form of the infectious agent so that you have the chance to mount an immune response. And then when you encounter the infection in real life, uh, you've already had this immune response at the ready so that you can successfully fight off the infection and not have to suffer the consequences. And what are some of the common childhood vaccines that have been in use for decades that you mentioned? Well, so um, uh, measles, mumps, rubella, diphtheria, uh, tetanus, pertussis, um, polio, there, there, there have been really huge uh, successes with, with many of these vaccines. So with these diseases that used to cause huge numbers of cases every year and very large numbers of fatalities, those diseases have largely disappeared because of vaccination. So there are some really, including diseases like measles and mumps and rubella that even in my career starting 30 years ago that I have, I've never seen those diseases because they were already largely eliminated um, before I started practice. But the one that really hits home with me is um, Haemophilus influenza type B disease. So as a pediatric resident, I very re definitely remember uh, children dying from uh, H flu meningitis and sepsis and so forth. And if you ask pediatric residents about that now, uh, that's clearly something from a history book. They just don't see that because the um, Hib vaccines have largely eliminated those those uh, cases. So, it uh, when vaccines are are really one of the most important and, and successful achievements of of medicine. Oh yeah, that's a great background. Thank you. Now, um, you know, we live in very interesting times for a lot of reasons. Uh, one of which is because. Uh, we have just rapid access to all kinds of information and breaking news and with social media and everything is always in our face all the time. And we really lack the ability to you know, digest a lot of the information that is being thrown at us all day, every day. And along those lines, there's been a lot of concern and misinformation surrounding, you know, these COVID-19 vaccines and how they're developed, especially with this, uh, you know, the terms of like Operation Warp Speed and uh, perhaps uh, notions that these vaccines are being rushed into use. So along those lines, can you give us some background into, you know, the process used for vaccine development in general, and then specifically why these COVID-19 vaccines have been able to be developed so quickly? Sure. So I think the the answer to the reason that why they've been developed so quickly is because of the obvious enormous need as the pandemic spread around the world that we were going to need vaccines for these diseases. And then appropriately, uh, governments, including ours, um, devoted billions of dollars to the development of the vaccines. And uh, also importantly, um, knowing that they would want to have the vaccines available as, as soon as possible, not only put money into the studies that would need to be done to develop the vaccines and prove their safety and effectiveness, but also actually start manufacturing the vaccines at the same time so that at, at the absolute moment that they were approved for use, that there would be millions of doses ready to go to uh, to ship out and start vaccinating people given the the importance of uh, of getting the, the pandemic under control quickly. But importantly, uh, even though the vaccines, the, the two that have been approved thus far, uh, have what's called an emergency use authorization, an EUA, which is a little different than the normal approval that vaccines and other medical uh, products get from the FDA, but the process really was not any different. So the, the studies that were done um, the um, review of the data from those studies being done by independent scientific 
uh, experts is exactly the same as what's been done uh, with other vaccines. So uh, other than the fact that the, the timeline has been condensed uh, because of the importance of the task, the, the review process and the, the studies uh, really are, are sound. And I think people can have confidence that the uh, designation that these vaccines are safe and effective is, is sound and, and feel confident in, in that information and receiving the vaccine. Mm. And I, I'm sure you've read them as well, but I, I've been astounded at the complete transparency, not only from the companies, but with the FDA. Anybody can you know, fully access all of the safety and efficacy data from both Pfizer and Moderna regarding their vaccines. And both FDA hearings over the last couple of weeks have been fully available for anybody to view uh, in the general public. So from a transparency standpoint, my goodness, um, if you have questions about it, it is out there. Uh, in fact, there's there's so much information that it takes a long time to go through it. No, uh, absolutely. Yeah, that, I think that's that really has been important because um, we don't want people to think that these vaccines were somehow developed in the dark or were rushed through somehow or, or there were uh, shortcuts taken. And just as you said, they have been absolutely as transparent as they can be um, about the entire process. All the data is available. The, the meetings where the decisions were made, as you said, were literally live streamed. People could could watch the process in action. So I hope that that will inspire confidence. As an aside, in the hearings that you've been involved with as a member of some of these panels with the FDA, have they been live streamed in the past or is this something completely new? Uh, they are typically recorded and are often uh, live streamed. And so that is um, typically something that's available. And then there's also a, a, trans a transcript that's made available um, afterwards. And I think you can see too, for the people who were able to see the meetings, these, even though we're calling these an FDA panel or a CDC panel, the, the people who are assembled are people like me. I don't, I don't work for the FDA or the CDC. I've just been asked because of a particular um, interest or expertise that I have to come and weigh in and offer my opinion. And that's true of the other people on these panels. So um, the, the people who are, are weighing in on these advisory panels or people who are selected to have a have particular expertise and cover a broad range of experiences. And uh, that's, that's what's being brought to the table to advise the, the government uh, organizations. Mm, that's an important point. Thank you. It, um, both the Pfizer and Moderna COVID vaccines that are now available in the United States utilize this mRNA technology. Can you explain to our listeners what mRNA is and how, you know, in a vaccine, does this produce a protective immune response? Sure. So um, uh, as I mentioned previously, most uh, vaccines consist of some modified form of the infectious agent. So whether it's a bacteria or a virus, um, they, they kill the infectious organism or attenuate it in some way so that it can't cause disease in people with normal immune function. And then when it's injected into you, it's enough to stimulate an immune response, but, but not actually cause disease. But the, the thing that's being injected is, is the organism itself that's been modified or attenuated. In this case, this really is a novel um, process. So in the mRNA vaccines for messenger RNA, the, um, the mRNA encodes for a particular protein. I'm sure everybody's seen the picture now of what the coronavirus looks like. It has all these spikes on the outside of it. And those, that spike protein is actually what the virus uses to gain access to cells to cause infection in those cells and in, and in patients. And so this little piece of genetic material encodes for that spike protein. So when the vaccine's injected into your arm, the, the muscle cells that it's been injected into and other immune cells that are in the vicinity um, take up this messenger RNA and actually start producing the uh, spike protein. So rather than having to inject somebody with the spike protein, which other vaccines that are coming are using that technology, but in this case, the, uh, rather than injecting the spike protein, we're uh, injecting the messenger RNA so that the cells in your arm can actually manufacture the spike protein. 
And, and that turns out to stimulate a very robust uh, immune response, both with the production of antibodies against the spike protein and uh, a cellular uh, immune response, kind of the other big aspect of your immune response in addition to antibody production are uh, specialized lymphocytes that can also deal with the infection. So um, importantly, the, the, it, sometimes it sounds a little scary to people to think that you're being injected with some sort of genetic information, but the, the messenger RNA um, is, is itself uh, degraded in, in the cell and leaves no trace behind it. Does, it doesn't get into your genes or, or into your <laughs> DNA. Um, it's strictly being used to sort of have those cells temporarily crank out this uh, spike uh, protein so that you can mount an immune response against it. I think that's just so fascinating. Um, and just to be clear for everybody, does do does either the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine contain a COVID virus and can it cause infection? Absolutely not. So even the the protein that the mRNA encodes for, so once, once the cells in your arm start um, making, uh, temporarily producing this uh, spike protein, the spike protein itself cannot cause uh, in, infection. Um, and but by having antibodies against the spike protein, so having this process take place where you make this immune response to the spike protein, once you have the antibodies against it, when you encounter the virus in real life, those antibodies can attach to that spike protein that is on the surface of a real uh, coronavirus that you may have encountered in real life and prevent that virus then from getting into your cells and causing infection. But the vaccine itself, neither the, um, the messenger RNA nor the spike protein that's ultimately produced, neither of those things is capable of causing uh, infection and neither of them persists permanently in your, in your body. Excellent. Okay, thank you. All right, so let's get into some of the the nitty gritty fun details, um, shall we? And you know, I, one thing that I've been really intrigued by are the fact that we have all these different pharmaceutical companies utilizing different approaches to produce their vaccines, but yet they've all agreed to take similar approaches to their methodology and their clinical trials. So, can you summarize for us um, some of the 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 study design that um, Pfizer and Moderna both used, uh, especially the, what endpoints they used uh, to see if they provide a benefit? Sure. So uh, like all good medical trials for any sort of medical product, whether it's a vaccine or a pharmaceutical, um, this was done using uh, the, the gold standard for um, such studies, uh, double blind uh, placebo controlled challenges. So they took uh, thousands of people, 30,000 or more people, um, and uh, who, who would be susceptible to getting uh, coronavirus, which pretty much includes all of us at this point, um, and randomized them, meaning by chance they were either assigned to receive the vaccine or a placebo, an inert uh, saline injection. And so if they started with 30,000 people, that would mean 15,000 people got the actual vaccine. And in this case, it's two doses of the vaccine separated by either three or four weeks, depending on which vaccine, um, or they got placebo shots. Similarly, they would get two placebo shots separated by the same time frame. And then they followed those thousands of people forward in time as we all go about our daily lives and we're all susceptible to getting coronavirus. And they saw how many people out of that group actually ended up getting symptomatic coronavirus disease. So as soon as anybody in the study started to have any symptoms of uh, coronavirus, they would test them to see whether or not, in fact, they had, had gotten the disease. And then they were able to compare once the study was uh, done and the code was broken, they were able to see how many people among the 15,000 that got the real vaccine versus the 15,000 who got the placebo, how many of those people actually got the disease. And uh, the, the number of people who virtually everybody in the whole group altogether, almost everybody who got the disease had gotten the placebo shot. There were only a handful of people who had actually gotten the real vaccine who went, went on with their lives, who ended up getting the coronavirus uh, disease versus the people who'd gotten the placebo shot, a fair number of those people went on to get the, the disease. So it's, uh, it's very clear 
Um, and when you compare those two groups, that's where they come up with this 95% effectiveness. So if, for example, 100 people out of this study ended up getting coronavirus disease, 95 of those people had gotten the placebo and only five of them had gotten the, the actual vaccine. Um, the, the other thing is ev even in the handful of people who got the disease, none of them got severe disease. So the, the, the vaccines appear not only exceedingly effective at preventing people from getting ill, but also appear to be very effective at even those people who do get ill, preventing them from developing severe disease. So they're, they're really a home run as far as vaccines go. Mm. And you mentioned that both of these require two doses, one three weeks apart, one four weeks apart. Uh, one, now, now that these are being deployed in the general population for the most part, are these vaccines interchangeable or do people need to receive the same one twice? They really need to receive the same one twice um, they're they're very they're the same technology they're um, very similar components and and technology as far as how the vaccines work but without having done studies to say that you could get one dose of one and then get the, a different vaccine the second time um, there it's possible that the uh, way the spike proteins are made or the immune response happens could be slightly different with the two vaccines. So that just hasn't been studied. So at this point, um, the recommendation very definitely is that if you, whatever vaccine you get the first dose of, you need to get the same uh, vaccine for your, uh, for your second dose. Okay. And what are some of the common symptoms that were reported uh, in both of these trials for the participants that received um, the vaccine? Mm -hmm. So, with, as with virtually any vaccine, um, there's super common side effects. So lots of people who get any vaccine will have so-called injection site uh, reactions. So their arm gets red or hot or painful, and that might last for a few hours to a couple of days. So the you know your your arm gets sore, and that happens in a fair number of people. Um, and then um, again, as with most vaccines, there's potential uh, systemic uh, reactions where people kind of feel crummy for a, a day or two. They might have a headache, they might have a fever, they might feel tired. Um, and um, the, uh, those, those things in some respect, we think of that as being good. It, it, it sort of indicates because um, when your body is mounting this appropriate immune response to the vaccine, the, the, the immunologic response that's ultimately going to protect you from getting this disease, while that process is underway in the first few days after you get the vaccine, um, your, that, that robust immune response to the vaccine also leads to the production of substances that might cause those other uh, symptoms like fever or lethargy or headache or whatnot, but those those things are really um, quite minor and and uh, temporary. Mm. Did people in the placebo group also experience some of these side effects as well? Uh, yes, which is fascinating. So um, <laughs> and that, that's why that's one of the main reasons that uh, placebo controlled studies are required. I mean, any of us going about our uh, lives might have a headache or a fever on any given day or feel crummy. Um, and there's other viruses out there. We might get a cold. We might get the flu. So um, some some of the, the the reactions or what are called reactions to the vaccine, if it happened in the placebo group, of course that we can't blame that on the vaccine. So um, there are higher rates of these events in people who got the vaccine than who got the placebo. But but you're you're correct that some portion of them were were coincidental. Hmm. Now, you and I, as do many of our listeners, know very well that allergic conditions such as food allergies, medication allergies, allergic rhinitis, um, and so on and so forth, affect millions upon millions of people. Were people with these conditions um, excluded from these vaccine trials? Uh, actually, no. The, the um, um, only exclusion criteria relative to allergy was if you, if you had had a previous um, allergic reaction to some other vaccine which is quite uncommon, but, mm -hmm. but if, uh, so, so they, they did not exclude people with other types of allergy, only people who said that they'd had a reaction to a prior vaccine. 
Yeah, oh, thank you. I know that's a that's been a source of major misinformation from what I've seen among people, and I, it's really important to clarify that you know these trials did have people with you know food allergies and allergic rhinitis and so on and so forth, but along those lines, they still tracked whether or not there were allergic reactions to the vaccine. And within those trials, did they see any major differences uh, for those who received the vaccine or placebo? Um, they did see some allergic reactions, or at least things that are characterized as allergic reactions, and the um, the details um, vary from, the, they would most often be, for example, people who got hives, um, some percentage of people who got hives. And again, just as we were saying with the headache and fatigue and whatnot, I mean, if you follow thousands of people forward in time, hives are very common. So um, there, there, some of that also happened in the placebo group, but there was a slightly higher rate overall of what were thought of as being um, allergic reactions or what were characterized as potential allergic reactions like hives in the uh, group that got the vaccine versus the group that got placebo. Importantly, there, there's kind of a distinction between what they call um, numerical versus statistically. So the, the actual numbers of patients were slightly higher uh, who had those kinds of reactions but the, the the difference was not statistically significant. So from a statistic standpoint or a scientific standpoint, there really was not any difference in the placebo group and the group that got the vaccine relative to the amount of these allergic reactions that they had. And, and importantly, they also characterize all reactions, including allergic reactions as to whether or not they were serious. And there were in the, in the trials, there were no serious reactions, uh, allergic reactions reported. So there, there were no nobody had anaphylaxis from uh, the vaccines during the the trials of the of the thousands of people who were followed carefully during the trial. Um, it, among those who received the vaccine, none of those uh, uh, had anaphylactic reactions f during the trials. Mm. And as you as you summarized before, we're talking like seventy thousand total doses. If you look at both trials for those who received the vaccine, or, or somewhere thereabouts, correct? Correct. Yeah. Now, which is interesting because we're two weeks into public uh, vaccination campaigns um, in the United Kingdom and the United States, and we've already seen some isolated reports of suspected allergic reactions. Um, I think they had two in the first week in the United Kingdom, and then just this weekend, the Centers for Disease Control reported six out of almost 300,000 um, COVID vaccines administered in the United States last week. Do we have any details on those reactions or what may have caused them? Well, so um, that ju just as you're implying, that was kind of a surprise because here's all these tens of thousands of people who got the vaccine um, during the trials, but um, w with no anaphylactic reactions reported. And then the very first day they start administering it to um, people after it was approved, then we start seeing these um, anaphylactic reactions. Now, Again, it has to be put in perspective. These are these are tiny percentages, so this is a very small number of patients. But anaphylaxis is a potentially uh, serious uh, vaccine reaction. Um, overall, just of of all vaccines, uh, it, it's a known potential reaction to a vaccine. So about one in a million mm. vaccines that are administered of all vaccines on average, about one in a million will cause an anaphylactic reaction. Um, so the, the, the thought that anaphylaxis could occur in response to a vaccine is not surprising. Um, given how rare the reactions are, it's not surprising that it would not have necessarily happened during the trials, but not until the vaccines were administered to a much larger number of people that you would see such a rare event. Now, the, the numbers that, are, that have been reported so far, even though they're very small, um, relative to the number of doses that have been administered thus far, indicate that the, the rate of anaphylaxis for these vaccines, it's possible that it really is higher than one in a million. So, so, so maybe it's higher than that. Um, the, um, there's really only um, kind of vague details about the reactions. The, um, the, the consensus is that, in, in people who have actually 
seen the cases and have more detail that these really were anaphylactic reactions, that the, the nature and the timing of the reactions relative to the vaccine would in fact suggest that they, the patient did have anaphylaxis and that um, the, the vaccine is the likely cause just because they typically happen within minutes of the injection. So um, they probably are anaphylactic reactions. And um, most uh, allergens, almost all allergens are proteins. Um, and unlike most vaccines, these vaccines, these messenger RNA vaccines, they don't contain any protein. So um, this, this mRNA, which is really the uh, element that we described that, that ultimately leads to the immune response, the messenger RNA is, is delivered into your arm in a little nanoparticle that uh, has a lipid coating. So it's kind of a very sophisticated lipid nanoparticle with the mRNA inside. And even though most allergens are proteins, there are exceptions to that. And one of the exceptions happens to be uh, polyethylene glycol or PEG, which is uh, has not been used in other vaccines, but is used in other medicinal products and also in lots of non-medicinal products. And there have in fact been uh, anaphylactic reactions reported in people who received PEG containing uh, medicinal agents, where it was subsequently determined that the patient had in fact made IgE allergic antibodies against the, uh, the PEG, uh, the polyethylene glycol component. So the, the, this is very, very early because you know re we're really just within days of these reactions occurring. But if you look at the components of the vaccine, the, the component that's in there that conceivably could be the cause, that could be allergenic. The, the focus, at least right now, is on this uh, PEG or polyethylene glycol. Um, you'd still have to explain then, well, you know, the, these patients clearly have never gotten a COVID shot before. This is happening on everybody's first vaccine, and that seems to defy what we know about allergic reactions, is, which is that you have to have had some prior exposure to become sensitized before you can have a reaction. Um, but just as we learned that uh, children can have a reaction the first time they eat peanut butter, even though they weren't born allergic, their prior exposure didn't necessarily have to be eating peanut butter that we think now, in fact, that most children get sensitized through their skin to household exposure to peanut protein. So it's possible in the case of these patients having a reaction to this vaccine, even though it's the first time they've ever had peg injected into them in a vaccine, that some prior exposure, either through some other medicine they received that contained it, or these non-medicinal uh, products. It's in lots of foods and cosmetics and other products. So it's conceivable that somebody had a prior um, exposure to peg, started making an immune allergic response, made IgE antibodies against it, but didn't actually have a reaction, but they're they're sensitized so that they they really could potentially have a reaction once it's injected into them in uh, with this vaccine. Now again, that's all complete speculation at this point. <laughs> um, it's just um, it's it's that that's kind of where the thought is going. Is that it does look like these people had anaphylactic reactions. If they are, we need to look for what might be in the vaccine that that could have provoked such a reaction, and. Um, start uh, the 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 thing that kind of stood out to everybody is this peg at this point, but it could turn out that it's some other component or some other mechanism that hasn't been sorted out uh, yet. But that's where the the thoughts are at the moment. Mm, well, I really appreciate your perspective on that, and I just want to emphasize what you said is, um, you know, we're we're still waiting for confirmation. Uh, these are isolated reports. Uh, there's a signal there, but we don't know um, why. Uh, or how or what. So I, you know, stay tuned and, you know, hopefully we'll get some more information soon. And along those lines, uh, you know, is there a way to figure out exactly what part of the vaccine may have caused an allergic reaction in these individuals? Uh, or certainly if people experience these symptoms moving forward, some protocols that can be put into place uh, to evaluate further? And, you know, how does that relate to approaches used for similar concerns to other vaccines? So def absolutely. So um, in individual patients who have suffered what appears to be an anaphylactic reaction to a vaccine, again, where the, the nature and timing of what occurred is consistent with an anaphylactic reaction. So um, symptom onset within minutes, 
that would typically include evidence of an IgE mediated mast cell uh, mediated systemic reaction. So typically urticaria with some combination of um, symptoms of hypotension or respiratory distress would be what would be the sort of most common um, set of symptoms. Um, within minutes of receiving the vaccine, if you just looked at that, you'd say that certainly looks like the, the nature and timing of that would be consistent with an anaphylactic reaction. And then <clears throat> to look to see if in fact it's IgE mediated. So um, just like with other things, we do uh, skin tests to see if people have IgE antibodies to things. So um, uh, um, evaluation of such a patient would include skin testing them with the, the suspect vaccine. Now, um, one thought about that would be that you're, you're wasting a dose of a very precious resource at this point, a dose of the vaccine to, to perform skin testing with it. But given the importance of figuring out whether or not these reactions really are allergic and the culprit allergen and um, uh, going forward, I think it's absolutely appropriate uh, to do that. So typically the evaluation would involve skin testing the patient with the vaccine itself. In the absence of knowing um, anything about COVID vaccine skin testing, because it's never been done, that likely would include um, a prick type skin test with the vaccine uh, full strength or undiluted. And then if that was negative, an intradermal test with the vaccine diluted one to 100. And then again, since we're talking about skin testing, um, people who've had these possible reactions with something that nobody's ever done a skin test with before, even if the test was positive in that in such a patient, it would be important to put the same skin test reagents on people who uh, control subjects, either pre preferably people who had received the vaccine uneventfully, or or even uh, people who had not gotten the vaccine as controls, to make sure that it's not an irritant uh, reaction in the skin. But if you were evaluating a patient who'd had such a reaction and they had positive skin tests to the vaccine at a concentration that was negative on control subjects, that would strongly imply that it was in fact an IgE mediated uh, reaction. Even that wouldn't tell you sp what component of the vaccine the patient had made the IgE antibody to. And for that, you would need um, further tests. Now, for example, with this PEG, the polyethylene glycol, there, there are no commercially available assays available uh, for uh, evaluation for specific uh, serum-specific IgE antibody to PEG, but there are laboratories who have published, including very recent publications, where they do, in fact, have assays up and running to evaluate for IgE to PEG. So the, 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 it's very likely that this small number of patients um, have had serum obtained where that serum is being evaluated in these special laboratory research laboratories to see whether or not they're making uh, IgE to PEG. So that's kind of the evaluation. The other part of an evaluation would be that in a patient who had an apparent anaphylactic uh, reaction to a vaccine, after the reaction itself, of course, had been uh, treated with epinephrine and whatever else was required, to obtain a blood sample at the time of, of the reaction for a serum tryptase level. So um, as you know, in, in uh, a, a blood sample obtained within a few hours of an apparent anaphylactic uh, event, if, if the serum tryptase is elevated in that time frame, that virtually assures that the event was in fact anaphylaxis. If the serum tryptase is, is normal in that time frame, that doesn't exclude the diagnosis of anaphylaxis, but if it's elevated, it confirms the diagnosis. And so that's, I think, another important piece of this as, as, as we go forward. If somebody does in fact happen to see one of these reactions that they would, um, uh, after the dust settles, after the patient's been successfully treated, that they would get a blood sample uh, in a timely fashion for, for an ass assessment of a, of a tryptase level. 
Wow, that is, uh, I mean, you just get, basically gave us a, a mini primer on uh, evaluation of uh, suspected IgE mediated reactions to vaccines. That was wonderful information. Uh, and as you mentioned, I'm sure the story will evolve. So hopefully our listeners will stay up to date with all the, the current recommendations as more information comes in. Uh, you mentioned the, the clinical presentation of a suspected anaphylactic reaction to a vaccine. Are there other reasons why somebody could have a, a very dramatic sudden onset sort of uh, suspected reaction to a vaccine that has nothing to do with allergy? Absolutely. Um, and with, with vaccines in, in, uh, in particular, so near, near the top of the list of other uh, events that could happen that might mimic an anaphylactic reaction uh, would be a vasovagal reaction. Mm -hmm. So um, those can occur in anybody of any age. They're sort of more common in adolescents and young adults, but they can occur in anybody. Um, it doesn't happen have to happen right as the injection is being given, it can happen within you know, a few minutes later. So in the time frame that might otherwise look like anaphylaxis. Basal vagal reactions can very definitely cause syncope. So you can have syncope from anaphylaxis, you can have syncope from a basal vagal reaction. The, the distinction clinically is typically sorted out by the, the other symptoms. So in anaphylaxis, the thing that makes you ultimately have syncope is hypotension. So histamine is a very potent vasodilator. So patients will typically be flushed. Um, and uh, that initial vasodilatation, there's an initial compensation for that by tachycardia. So there's a reflex tachycardia. People become, in anaphylaxis, people become tachycardic before they become hypotensive and they're typically flushed. In a vasovagal reaction, the way that the person be, had syncope was because of uh, bradycardia, um, which is the initial event, and the bradycardia leads to pallor, and then the 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 bradycardia leads to hypotension and, and syncope. So the uh, if somebody is flushed and tachycardic before they lose consciousness, that sounds like anaphylaxis. If somebody's bradycardic and pale before they lose consciousness, that sounds much more like a, a vasovagal reaction. So that's um, certainly a possibility and has absolutely been reported um, as, a, as a consequence of, of vaccination. Um, other things, uh, uh, people can have, for example, vocal cord um, spasm um, that would cause stridor and respiratory distress that, that could look like an anaphylactic reaction. Um, people can have uh, anxiety or panic attacks or hyperventilation, other things where they might appear to be in respiratory distress or uh, distress in some other way that are actually not related to any sort of vaccine reaction. So the, um, I think you have to kind of err on the side of you, you, you can't hurt people by giving them epinephrine. So um, if, if, if something looks like it might be anaphylactic, you sort of have to err on the side of treating it that way. But uh, as you're suggesting, it's absolutely important to consider that there, there is a differential. There's, there's other things that might happen to somebody after they get these vaccines that would look like anaphylaxis, but in fact is not. Mm, okay. Um, if it's okay, as we sort of uh, wrap up after this wonderful conversation, I have some more, not rapid fire questions, but some common questions that I know a lot of people are asking. Uh, would it be okay with you if we just kind of went through these one by one? Sure. Okay. Um, so after the United Kingdom reported their two um, allergic reactions, the United States said that everybody who receives a COVID-19 vaccine should be monitored for 15 minutes uh, with the capability of you know, watching them to see if a reaction occurs and then treating them, or if you have a history of anaphylaxis to an injectable medication to monitor for 30 minutes. So first question, does anaphylaxis to a vaccine happen that fast and can it be treated if it does occur? Uh, it almost always would occur in that time frame and is almost always successfully and promptly treated with the prompt administration of uh, epinephrine administered intramuscularly in the thigh. Excellent. Okay. Um, will adverse reactions to COVID vaccines continue to be monitored now that they're being used in the general population, or are we, are we done with all that? Oh, no. They're very definitely <laughs> continuing to monitor this, and not only with the existing uh, vaccine monitoring system, such as the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, or VAERS, uh, the Vaccine Safety Data Link, which is a, 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 a forward-looking uh, active surveillance system. So those, those, those systems are already in place. But in addition, for these vaccines, the CDC has come up um, true to the times with a smartphone app called vSafe mm -hmm. that uh, 
people who get the vaccine can put the app on their phone and they have the, the chance to report in real time any sort of adverse reaction they may have. So there very definitely is very active ongoing monitoring uh, for any sort of safety signal that might occur with these vaccines. No, I'm glad you mentioned that. I didn't even know that was in existence. And then some of our colleagues have been posting their updates on social media with some of the, you know, the app checking in with them to report symptoms. So that's even more robust than um, than just the VAERS alone, which is great. Um, are there any food allergens or cross-reactive allergens to food proteins present in either the Pfizer or Moderna vaccines? No. So I, I think the reason that, and that's really caused a lot of concern. So mm -hmm. I, I can't fault them. I mean, in the UK, they were faced on the very first day of administering the vaccine with these anaphylactic reactions. And um, one or more of the patients who had them also had a food allergy. So, you know, right off the bat, you could say, well, gosh, maybe food allergy is the, is the risk factor. Um, but given what's in the vaccine, it's, it's inconceivable that food allergy um, could be a, a risk factor for um, reactions to these vaccines. And so um, the CDC here in the US, maybe just because they had a little longer to think about it, um, made less restrictive precautions uh, that you described. So really the, the only, uh, they haven't listed any contraindications. They haven't listed anybody who has any sort of allergic reaction, in, unless it's to some specific component of the vaccine. So if you're one of those super rare people who's already been identified as PEG allergic, then you shouldn't get this vaccine. But that's a tiny number of people. Mm -hmm. um, anybody else, even people who have a history of other allergic reactions um, can, can and should get the vaccine with the only additional precaution that you're gonna wait an extra 15 minutes after you get your vaccine. Um, and yes, that would be a reasonable time frame to observe people and, and pick up anaphylaxis if it were to occur. Uh, how long will it take someone to build protective immunity after they receive their COVID-19 vaccine, or more specifically, after they receive their second dose of the mm -hmm. vaccine? So it looks like the the um, separation between the uh, vaccines versus the people who got the vaccine versus the people who got the placebo, and as we mentioned, you know, if for example, if 95 people are going to end up getting COVID who got the placebo, and only five with the um, who got the actual vaccine, the, the separation between those groups actually looks like it starts to occur pretty early, even even after maybe a 10 days or so, even after the first vaccine. So, so you, you probably are getting sort of partial immunity um, even after the first dose, but after the, the second dose, um, when, when you get this boost, so then maybe another week or 10 days after your second dose, you would probably um, be at sort of your full immune response that you're going to to mount, but you may in fact receive some uh, earlier protection. Importantly, though, people should not count on one dose of a two dose vaccine uh, uh, and think and think they're protected. And mm -hmm. particularly people who happen to get a sore arm or feel crummy after their first dose. Um, they still absolutely need to go back and get their second dose so that they can be fully protected against uh, against this disease. So one one dose and early on, you may get a little bit of protection, but, but really the protection we're talking about giving people that's so impressive absolutely requires the two doses and probably is achieved within a week or so after getting that second dose. Oh, boy, that's really encouraging. Uh, but, you know, do people who receive the, the vaccine need to continue to wear masks and practice physical distancing? And if so, why? Absolutely, they do. So <laughs> um, the, um, the, the, the pandemic is still ongoing um, until, until we see the number of cases, hospitalizations and deaths come down. Um, people absolutely still need to uh, wear a mask, uh, practice social distancing, and not gather with people outside their their home. Uh, the 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 vaccine is still out there; it's still circulating. People um, may think of themselves as being protected, and again, they do have a, a very large amount of protection once they've received both their doses of the vaccine. But they shouldn't uh, think of themselves as being um, Superman. There, there, they're not. There's is. There are still some small percentage of people, even who've been vaccinated, who still get the disease. Um, so there, there, there. The risk is still there when it's so common, when it's still circulating at such huge numbers uh, in the community. 
Also, uh, one unanswered question about the vaccines um, that, that you may have heard mentioned that was not evaluated was, do people who have gotten the vaccine, could they still be spreading the, the disease? The, the assumption is that they're, they're not, but we don't really know that because they didn't get COVID tests on everybody every week in these trials to see did they become positive. We don't know that, they, they, that some of the people who did not get symptoms and therefore were not tested to see whether they had COVID, some of those people may have asymptomatic disease. So um, a person who's been vaccinated is not completely protected either for themselves, and it is also still possible that even after vaccination, they could still spread the disease. So the, the likelihood of those things is very small, but, but while the disease is still rampant in the community, even people who have been vaccinated absolutely need to continue to practice those uh, measures to protect themselves and their uh, fellow community members. Mm. Uh, what about somebody who has previously had COVID-19 or they're unsure if, they, if they've had it? Uh, what are the current recommendations about whether they should receive a vaccine? They absolutely should get vaccinated. So the current recommendation is um, that even somebody who had, had symptoms, um, was tested positive, who, who was known to have COVID should still get uh, the vaccine because um, we don't really know how long protection from either from the disease or from the vaccine, how long that protection is going uh, to last. And it is true that if you've had the disease, you've mounted an immune response, you have some amount of immunity, but there are uh, rare but reported cases of people who have gotten the disease more than once. And so um, having the disease doesn't mean you're, you won't get it again. Uh, and because we don't know and the comparison between the immunity you get from the disease and the vaccine, we um, the, the recommendation is still that um, e even if you've had the disease, that you should go ahead and, and get vaccinated to, to have this additional protection. Mm. And I know they weren't actively enrolled uh, or recruited to participate in the trials, uh, but do we have recommendations for uh, women who are pregnant uh, or for those who are actively breastfeeding? Mm -hmm. So um, the, the CDC very wisely, while they were dealing with this issue about contraindications relative to people who might have had various allergies, also took the time to say that if you're pregnant or breastfeeding, that those are not um, contraindications or precautions to the, to the vaccine. So um, they, they have a little asterisk by them in the, in the guidance, but the, the asterisk is that it's a discussion you should have with your patient. So if you have a patient who's pregnant or, or breastfeeding, um, um, Clearly, we ha have to say that the the we don't have any long-term safety data on large numbers of women who are pregnant or, or or breastfeeding as far as the vaccine, but but we have no reason to believe, given the way that the vaccine works and um, the the immune response you amount to, we have absolutely no reason to believe that it would pose any uh, risk to to somebody who's pregnant or or breastfeeding. So, other than acknowledging the fact that we don't have a lot of data on that, um, the, the recommendation is that, th that those are not reasons to not get the vaccine, particularly given the seriousness uh, of, of the disease that we're trying to prevent. Mm, okay. Uh, and then one last thing that you touched upon, um, but I think it, it merits some a, a little bit of additional discussion is you mentioned that the pandemic is not over just because these vaccines rolled out this week <laughs> or last week. Um, we still need to practice a lot of the, you know, the physical distancing and wearing masks. But regarding the concept surrounding herd immunity, do we have any idea what percentage of people need to actually receive both doses of this vaccine or other vaccines down the road before we can you know, even achieve herd immunity and maybe start to return to some semblance of normalcy? Mm -hmm. So uh, the, um, the, just the, the concept of herd immunity is that if there's enough people in the population who are immune or protected from getting the disease, it's harder to spread the disease around. So that kind of makes sense. There, there's two ways to achieve that immunity, as we said, either having the disease or being vaccinated or both. And once we get enough people in the population um, who are protected in that way because they've already mounted an immune response, then it'll the 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 spreading of the disease, the the virus itself, it won't have as many hosts, and it'll be harder uh, to spread it around, and, and eventually the cases uh, will will come down. 
the, the, the level of herd immunity that's required for different infectious diseases is different. So um, for example, with measles, which is an incredibly infectious, contagious disease, um, it requires something like 94 or 95% of the population to, to be protected in order to, to, to have the, that, that level of herd immunity to protect, to keep the disease from spreading in the community, which is why in communities where um, for vaccine hesitancy or other reasons, measles vaccine isn't, isn't given, there clearly are still outbreaks of, of measles. So, so that requires a very high level. Initially, they thought with um, the COVID, it's, it clearly it's very contagious or very infectious, but not the same as measles. But given its level of contagiousness, um, the, the, the current consensus is somewhere like 60 or 80%. So, so it's gonna require a substantial percentage of the population to be immunized against this vaccine and have the immunity kick in before we see an, uh, that able to, to uh, halt the, the, the rapid spread of the, of the virus. So we, we need most people vaccinated. Yeah, and for some perspective, after the first week with almost 300,000 doses, uh, you're describing the need to vaccinate 200 million or more. Uh, so it's gonna take some time. Uh, absolutely, and we'll and we'll have more vaccines, and that's why it's mm -hmm. good that we're we're having all these other vaccines uh, in in the pipeline um, for those few people who've had a reaction to one of these early vaccines and aren't going to get their second dose. Then maybe we can offer them one of the other ones that comes mm -hmm. uh, comes along. Um, so just just in terms of the the, the sheer numbers of vaccine doses that we're going to need, and and the possibility that as we go along, it may turn out that one vaccine is sort of preferred for a different population, but we'll learn all that as we go along. But right now we're, we're, we're uh, getting out vaccines that are safe and effective and, um, and, and that's really what's gonna make a difference in turning the tide. Do you mind if I ask if you'll be willing to receive a COVID-19 vaccine and, and why or why not? Absolutely. So uh, we, we had already gotten an uh, email from uh, Scripps Clinic where I work that, that asked if you'd be willing to get the vaccine. And it took me about a half a second to click <laughs> the button that said yes. And um, I'm already jealous of my colleagues who've, whose numbers already come up and they've already gotten their vaccine. So as soon as I get the confirmatory email that tells me where and when I should be to get my uh, first COVID vaccine, I will absolutely be there. Oh, excellent. You know, I generally don't suffer from any type of like fear of missing out, but I have major FOMO right now because <laughs> we're, we we didn't receive the Pfizer vaccine where at my institution. So we're waiting on Moderna and it looks like it's going to be a few weeks, but uh, hopefully, you know, all of us can get vaccinated as soon as we desire. Well, oh, yeah, we you know, already have a little vaccine envy going around here too. People are yeah. saying, hey, well, how, how, how come he got it and I didn't get it yet? So <laughs> we're, we're, we're anxiously awaiting our vaccine. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Kelso, I mean, we covered so much ground in this wonderful, wonderful discussion, and I, I really can't thank you enough for taking um, time to be with us and for such an eloquent conversation and discussion of these very important concepts. Uh, this is really fantastic. Uh, before we depart, do you have any final thoughts for our listeners? Wear your mask, social distance, and do not gather with people outside your household until we turn this around. Oh, well said. We hope you enjoyed listening to today's episode. Please visit www.aaai.org for show notes and any pertinent links from today's conversation. If you like the show, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Spotify so you can receive new episodes in the future. Thank you again for listening.